Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. My guests today were something else. I have a fantastic cancer survivor and advocate, another fantastic business owner and advocate, and then finally a dear, dear friend who is an ally and an advocate and everything in between. Without further ado, my people. I got Bob Hammer, Tiffany Stewart, and Ralph Barcy. Enjoy. All right, now listen to me. If at any point your beer runs out, yes, don't tell me. Just do just get up and get you, it. Just do whatever you have we'll to do. Just keep talking. Okay. We're gonna keep talking. It's gonna be a beautiful thing. All right. Are we it's doing really an intro or you know is what? We... no, no? We're recording, son. Oh, we are right now. We're already recording. <laughs> I was gonna let you hear. No, I'm good. He doesn't care about hearing. Nope. I'm he doesn't good. Ca- he cares about speaking. That's why he's here. Isn't that right? That's absolutely correct. God bless you. Well, look, I feel obliged to introduce everyone. We have Ralph Barcy, the man, the myth, the legend. Say hello, Ralph. Hello. How are you, Matt? I'm doing swimmingly. We have Bob Hammer. Thank you for being here, Hammer. Absolutely. And we have the lovely Tiffany from across the hall. Thank you, Tiffany, for joining us tonight. So glad to be here. So glad you are here. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for coming. So the man that brought us together, Ralph Barcy. Mm. It's great to be here, Matt. Great for you to be here. It's such a pleasure talking to you. So, Ralph, yep. obviously, you are next door neighbors with our good friend, uh, our good friend Hammer, mm-hmm. right? Hammer runs Have a Ball Foundation. Yep. Correct. Why? Why? You're going to gonna have to get closer to that mic, no. baby. Okay. Why do I do it? I do it for several reasons. Uh, one. Cancer has been a uh, part of my life since I was born. Um, my mom, my mom died of cancer when I was uh, nine years old on Christmas Day. So as a nine-year-old dude, dude, I'm gonna have to get another beer for this one. But yeah, we're gonna go right off the bat. We're just jumping in. But uh, yeah, so when your mom dies of cancer and she was sick by the time I was four or five, so your first memories of are of your mother being sick and um when that is your first memories of your mom and then she died on christmas day um so christmas i'm i'm 50 i just turned 52 yesterday so christmas as a 51 year old is still different when that happens you don't forget that then you go uh through life and you just I, I had just gotten married and I was I was in a good spot with my wife and uh, we were thinking the next step would be to have children. We were fortunate enough to have a, a child on the way and I got diagnosed with testicular cancer. So I was 29 years old when that happened. I was I was married for a year and a half and uh, just bought a house in San Carlos with my wife and everything was rolling pretty good. Um, so when you get diagnosed at 29 years old, um, that changes things, obviously. That changes things financially. And then you're then you're 30 years old, and I was I was I just turned 31, and cancer came back. So as a 31 year old guy, when I when I had it the first time, um, it was just in my testicle, and literally, that's why we call it have a ball. In case anybody out there is wondering, don't say you've lost your sense of humor. The have a ball, yeah. So when you lose your testicle, uh, so I, I lost my testicle at 29, and um, the the story is that I was I was good to go after that. I, I had a I had a check at I had a checkup six months later, everything was cool. Um, five months after that, I was and I was coaching at the time. I was 30 years old, and I was in good shape, very good shape. I was coaching uh, track at a high school over on the peninsula called Carmont High School. That's the school that I went to and athletic director knew me and asked me to come back and help the kids. So I ended up coaching uh, track and field over at Carmont for 17 years, sidebar. And uh, But I was coaching track. I was playing softball three nights a week, like hardcore, you know, hardcore competitive softball three nights a week. And I was experiencing some back pains for a while. I knew that I had just lost my testicle, but when you're 30 years old and, and that happens, you figure, dude, I just had a checkup. I'm fine. 
I'm sure it's just because I'm coaching kids and or I'm playing softball. Then it got worse. Started going to chiropractor. Got worse again, and I was I was starting to fear, experience pain every day. So uh, it ended up being 21 weeks after I was I had a CT scan. I was cleared for six months, so it was May. So 21 weeks after that, like I was just I was wrapping a gift for my daughter. She had just turned. She was just born, and uh, I collapsed, and um, that changed that changed everything again. Um, so went to the ER and and uh, ended up leaving the ER room that night. It was a uh, Thursday. It was a Friday night. Got diagnosed that it was it had come back, and I had a uh, I, I can't explain it, but it, like a like a huge cantaloupe. Like the biggest cantaloupe like mass, you've ever seen. A big mass. Uh, it was a cantaloupe-sized tumor in my stomach, and it then it took like a like the biggest cucumber you'd ever imagine, and it went up, all the way up into my neck. And I'm you know I'm, we're looking at the screen. It's a Friday night. I'm at an oncology office, and I'm at an oncology office in Redwood City. It's a Friday night, and you know it's like noon that day. I was playing with my kid and. Eight o'clock that night. It's uh, you know I you you think of yourself as a, a young and virile young man, and I'm in a gynecology chair as a guy, and I've got four like young hot nurses, and I'm sitting there just buck naked, right? And everybody's like in there, and I, I'm, you're like, okay, okay, here I am. This is I changed. shouldn't be laughing. I'm sorry. No, it's funny, and that's so. Things like that don't leave your mind, right? I don't talk about it a lot. She's never heard any of these stories about why I do what I do. But um, so the, the next the next phase of that of why I do what I do is the first part was when your mom dies at nine years old on Christmas Day, that leaves a mark. When you get diagnosed at 29, that leaves a mark. When you lose a ball at 29 years old, that leaves a freaking mark. When it comes back at 31, that leaves a mark. So I did, uh, <clears throat> I ended up doing 26 rounds of chemo uh, through Sequoia Hospital in Redwood City. And the, the chemo that I did um, was actually stronger than what they gave the dude Lance Armstrong. So the, the doctor came into my wife and she told me this on my, on our, on my five year cancer anniversary. The doctor had come in that night and he said, um, so Mrs. Hammer, what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna backdate this, what's happening right now. I'm gonna backdate this by three days. Monday morning, you're gonna call your husband's insurance agency and you're gonna update his insurance policy to $1 million. And nobody's gonna know, but you need to protect your child and yourself. You, did, you guys just bought a house. He's got about a 5% chance of living. So she did. She called the insurance company. But she, when she went home that night, like I got up the next day. This is a Friday night. I got up the next day and she got up with me. And what are you doing? You got to go mow the lawn like, like it's another freaking day. So you, I got up, mowed the lawn did all my stuff that I would normally do. And then I did my first treatment of chemo and I did. So when I say 26 rounds of chemo, I'm talking, I'm talking, I went, so I went, if I went on a one round was I went five days and I went from 11 o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. And then I'd get up the next morning and I would work. I went to work in the morning cause I was, you know, 31 years old and tried to get a job and have a mortgage and so there's phase three of how it sticks with you, right? And you don't, you don't forget that. You don't, one of the things that I've done through the foundation, and I'll, I'm sidetracking for a second, but one of the things that I've done through the foundation is I just got off the phone. I just dropped everything today and talked to a go, dude from Danville who's going through cancer right now. And I've quietly probably helped 500 people over the last 15 years of 
just talking them off the ledge or talking them through different diagnoses. Um, but getting back to the, the main, your, your, main, your main question was, why do I do it? So mom dies at nine, diagnosed at 29, diagnosed at 31. So at, uh, I did the 26 rounds of chemo. Five, one round was seven hours a day, five days a week. Then I'd wait for two weeks, come back and do it again, 26 times. When I was going through that, uh, a buddy of mine dropped my uh, book off at my door called It's Not About the Bike by, by Lance Armstrong. It's a good book. Good book, great book. And when you have testicular cancer at that time, and this dude had testicular cancer, you read the book, and um, I decided that I wanted to try to raise money to be able to go down to Texas and be a part of these these other people who had gone through the same thing that I'm going through. So my company helped me. I raised some money. I think it was 11,000 bucks, but 10 grand puts you in like this exclusive club, right? So I literally finished my last round of treatment on a Wednesday. Kim, my wife Kim and I got on a plane on a Thursday. So I was, like I said, 31 years old, stark white, bald, no eyelashes, rolled up and walked into the Omni Austin. Shiner Bach, please <laughs> sit at the bar. And within five minutes, a couple people walk up. Within five more minutes, a couple more people walk up. About a half an hour in, these two guys walk up to me and they're from San Mateo, which is over on the peninsula which where I was living at the time I was living in San Carlos and they go, uh, well, clearly you're the dude with cancer here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, but we know a guy that you need to go meet. So we walk over and we sit down and we talk with Lance there. They had gone through cancer with Lance and, uh, and then one of the guys actually half joking, but all serious. Yeah. Well, f- forget this guy. You actually need to meet that guy, which was Dr. Craig Nichols, who was Lance's oncologist. And Lance Armstrong's team of doctors hired this guy because he was the preeminent testicular cancer oncologist of his time. His his story is that he's got the first known cured patient of testicular cancer in 1975 or something like that. So he... He treated Lance Armstrong, and he happened to be there that night that I go to this thing, and it was a, uh, he was the keynote speaker at their big event, and um, he dropped everything when he heard about my story, and they actually delayed the dinner for a little bit because I said, I'm tired, I'm going to go to bed. He walked over to me at this table with my wife and I, listened to my story for 45 minutes, and I told him that I was scheduled to have a surgery. This is this is like the heart of the whole thing. I was at this thing, and he goes, I go, uh, yeah, well, I'm supposed, I'm supposed to have a surgery at Stanford on Tuesday. And he goes, surgery for what? He goes, well, I've got a, I've got this scar tissue on my spine at L5, and and um, they want to go in and get it out. And he goes, well, from what everything you're telling me, that's just that's simply scar tissue. If you do that, you'll never have kids again. You might not walk because I don't care who's doing it. You might not walk again. And I go, well, that's cool, Doc, but I got five Stanford surgeons telling me that I need this. And he goes, wow, a surgeon tells you need surgery. That's fucking crazy. (laughs) And I kind of like, and he kind of, then he goes, look at me, son. Just because we're doctors doesn't always mean we know everything there is to know you're just you're young and I get it but I'm telling you I've treated this 165 times and I'm telling you from everything that you're telling me that you should not have that surgery so you should probably go back to home to California I'll be home on Monday morning in Oregon at the University of Oregon and you're going to fax all your stuff up to me and I'll take a look at it. So I did that. Came home on a Monday from this trip. I was supposed to have surgery the next day. Faxed everything to him at 6 o'clock in the morning. He called me by 11 and said, don't have the surgery. I'm telling you, don't have the surgery. 
you will be fine. Your doctor at Stanford or at Sequoia Hospital did a phenomenal job with your treatment. That is scar tissue. The worst thing that you, the, the worst thing that you can do is have surgery tomorrow. The best thing that you can do is just wait. If it starts to come back, then we can talk about surgery. But for now, let it ride. So my wife and I had a decision to make. It was now, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm supposed to make a decision by four o'clock. And we decided that we were not going to have that surgery. Fast forward a year and a half later, um, Kim calls me at work, and uh, my wife, Kim, calls me at work and says, uh, you need to come home. We need to talk. I'm, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, what do you mean we need to talk? Who are you, who are you sleeping with? <laughs> The mailman's a woman. What are you talking about? Is it? Yeah. So you make a couple jokes, right? And she goes, no, you, we need to, f- yeah, no, when you, yeah, no, I'm, and she was just like in shock. Like, no, I'm, I'm freaking pregnant. Okay. That's, oh, okay. So there's the next, so ding, 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 ding. Why would I do it? I've I've got a, you know, I've got a 17-year-old boy now who, if I wasn't in Texas that weekend and I didn't run into that dude and have a Shiner Bach or two with a guy, my 17-year-old son wouldn't be here. So I, I was in charge of my company's golf tournament. I'm a very organized dude. And uh, I'm good at marketing and organization. So my, the boss of, uh, of mine at Hatcher Press in San Carlos, I was the, I was the first kid who worked on the floor as a, like a sweep in the floor. And I worked my way up and I was in management and I was an estimator. Only kid that kept the company had been around since 53. And uh, so, I'm working as an estimator for, for this guy, Chuck, and, and Chuck walks up to me and he goes, he, he's got this, like a box of shit. <laughs> You're up, Hammer. Oh, okay. He goes, yeah, this is our golf tournament. Um, so you're now in charge of it because you're the most organized kid I know. So you need to just figure it out. And he literally just turns around, walks to his desk, grabs his cigarette, Start smoking again. <laughs> and he's like, that's off my back. <laughs> so I get a hold of the thing and I, you know, <clears throat> I had my regular job during the day. And long story short, I, I took the golf tournament. And the first year we did it, the year before they had lost $27,000. The year that I got a hold of it, I only had it for like a half of a year. We, I got it down from $27,000 loss to... $7,000 the next year. So then I had run it for a year and a half. I made $31,000. Chuck walks up to me after the golf, like this was on a Friday night, Monday morning at 7 a.m. He walks in. We're making too much fucking money on the golf tournament. You got to dial it back. We can't, we I don't know what rain you did. in, son. I don't know what I you need did. that deduction. You're calling the forklift company? You're getting a sponsorship from our forklift company? I go... <laughs> Well, we spent, do you know how much money we gave to them? And he goes, I don't care. What? I go, okay. Okay. So. Why, why did he want you to make less money? Was it, was it a. He just, he just said, you've, you've done, you've done a great job. I just, didn't know. He, I didn't know if you don't need to, like, hey, we don't need, we buddy. don't. And then he like, then he, he dialed it back. It's like, we just, you don't need to make that much money. I, we, I just didn't want it. To, I didn't want to be a $30,000 loss. Right. We don't need to be a thirty thousand. We don't need to game. make an asset here. Right. We just need to. We want to have this event. And I built it up, and I so I had like the the forklift company, and and I had you know we had foursomes, and they had they had thirty seven people at their golf tournament. I had a hundred and seventy five the next year. So, I'm sitting there with my buddies one night in San Carlos, and it's after my son was born, and I'm I've got this story of my son, and and. Uh, I'm sitting there drinking a beer. We're playing darts in my backyard after a softball game, like I was telling you about. And, my, and I go, I think I'm going to try to do a golf tournament. I'd like, I'd really like to, I'd really like to raise like 2,500 bucks. I'd like to be able to give a check 
to the Lance Armstrong Foundation for 2,500 bucks. And my buddy, my buddy just kind of looks, my, all my buddies look at me like, really? Golf tournament? Okay, you're up. So then you, we throw the darts. That kind of started the whole thing. And um, I just, the real, the real drive was to, initially was to raise, I wanted a check to Lance Armstrong Foundation for 2500 bucks. That was my goal. My first golf tournament, we raised $52,000. So did, did you, if I may ask, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you give all of the 52 to the Lance Armstrong or did you break it up to different charities? The first year I gave it all Lance Armstrong Foundation. The second year I gave it all. So I started in 2005. By 2007, before Lance took his huge fall, <clears throat> 2000. 2006, 2007, 2008 was the height of Livestrong. Right. They the were, bands. They were monsters. The bands, they the whole thing. The whole thing. Right? The whole thing. So the Have a Ball Foundation was number two in the world for funds raised for the Lance Armstrong Foundation for three years. Two of those years were the I lost to a fashion designer who wrote a check for four hundred fifty thousand dollars because he just wanted. So he was just he wrote a check. It's tough. It's tough to fight the checks. So number two it's though tough. was this dude in a garage in California. Um, and then and then we all kind of started to seeing the when it when it changed. Like the the inner groupings of. The inner groupings of the LAF Lance Armstrong Foundation, the core group. When when we got a we got a, you get an email, and it, the email is we're thinking about going into a different direction. We're thinking about changing it from the Lance Armstrong Foundation to Live Strong, and you're like, he did drugs. <laughs> The the autobiographies, the not okay. about the bike and everything got moved to the fiction section of libraries. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep but on jokes. the other end on the other end, on the serious note. But on even, the serious note, so did everyone else. E like oh, that's yeah. the serious note. Even I love you, though Lance. even today, that foundation, which was not started by Lance Armstrong, by the way. That was started by Kristen Armstrong his wife. She's the one who had an idea. She's also the instrumental part of creating this foundation called Fertile Hope. You can look it up. They're still alive and thriving. Started by Kristen. She had a real problem with um, fertility. Is that is that the nature of the, the foundation? Because she, in, in the book, which I very fondly remember reading, and it was an inspiration as a younger person, I really remember reading about how it was this massive struggle for them. She was, she was, had a big needle phobia, which is what I remember, because I'm terrified of needles. And she would have to take these shots pretty much every night mm -hmm. for something like uh, four or five weeks or It's a whatever cycle it was. or something, yeah. Right, I, 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 I don't know the, the details. Story. I just remember them talking in the book about how her hand was shaking and she had to take these shots. And it was one of the, it was one of the first times I was about 21 when I read the book. It was one of the first times I, okay. I realized the the commitment that that a couple and specifically a mother had to have to have a kid. Right. Because for me, you know, when you're when you're younger, it's like, hey, look, Did don't have a kid. Oh, look at you guys! Look at Tiffany hooks it up. And again, the thing that the thing that you have to remember is as a younger person, people people talk Jesus. to you about, like everybody's interested in telling you about not having a kid or, you know, plan parent. I'm not saying I was very promiscuous or anything ridiculous like that. But what I am saying is it, it struck me that people would work so hard to have a child. And it, the, uh, the last time I got a flu shot before I was a... Uh, before I was having kids myself, because I had to get this whooping cough booster. 
the last time I had a flu shot, I was on the rowing team. I was a senior in college. I cried in front of the entire team. I was terrified of needles. And I read this book about this woman who also had this phobia that I could very, very intimately relate to. I was like, why would she shoot herself in the leg or like the butt with this thing to have a kid? Like, forget the kid. Who wants a kid? But they were into it. Yep. They were into it. She was she was committed. She wanted to, to have a baby. It's beautiful that that's what she did with herself, that that's yep. what she did after the Lance Foundation, the Fertility Foundation, because, yep. God, man, you have, you have such... There's so much love in the world to give, right. you know, and there are so many people that want... I have this great bit about having having kids and I tell all my students I'm like you realize your parents didn't have you for you right like they never sat around like Ralph's parents <laughs> didn't sit around and say gee I think Ralph would really enjoy being alive like we <laughs> we all know I actually think they did say that they were they were just kidding themselves my point is we all know that life is a really difficult thing if the last 25 minutes haven't outlined that for anyone it's a really horrific event being alive and I don't think younger people, 16 and 17 year olds, the ones I really work with, I really can articulate how much their per parents weren't thinking about them when they right. conceived the kid, right. right? They're thinking about, I want to have a baby. I want to smell that, that little infant head. I want to cuddle them. I want this little bundle of love. That's why people go over to newborns, parents who are new parents, and they're like, I need, I need snuggle time with right. a kid. It's like right? a puppy. Like, you just want to smell the new right. puppy. You're a, you don't buy the puppy for the puppy. You buy the puppy for you. And that's essentially, like, your parents had you because your mom wanted a dog and your dad wanted something else. And that's why they had you, right? right? And I mean, younger people just don't get that. When I was reading that book at 21, I right. didn't get that. I was like, what are they doing? But right. there's, now that I'm older, I see the nature of the love yeah. that, that loving couples have. And, and even, obviously, single people have. Just hu humans in general have an unyielding capacity to love if given the opportunity. Yeah. And they will fight for that opportunity. And to see hear about foundations like that obviously that's not that's not yours but it's similar right i mean we're we all need to work together as much as people want to say you know women are oppressed by men and you know sure. men are the devil and all this stuff it's like hey guess what we all got to get on with it yeah. we got to we got to get together with each other we have to we have to partner together we have to raise kids together we have to we have to work together even if it's not in a in a romantic sense we have to work together we're not going to be any better if we all just, you know, like you take the Asian continent and we take North America and trannies take South America. I don't know, whatever it is, right? Like, we we have to work together. America. What's that? I was just going to take South America, but you can You could take South America. Okay. You could go with the trannies. I don't I don't care. Yeah. My, my grandmother was born in South America, Australia. so Your grandmother? That's fine. I don't look. Whoever wants <laughs> South America, it's up to them. But I get Central America because I'm Mexican. So oh, okay. whatever, I'm good with it. Okay. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Keep going. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, you didn't. That, there's no interruptions here. That's that was your first rule. So I'm good. Um, but I think I th so. You got that whole beginning part of it, and yes, and up to now, I've got a kid who was here, and I wanted to write a check and then you you do that you do that first event and the, that first event's done and before that first event's over my buddy walks up and he's like how are you gonna top this next year and i'm like and i'm like literally throwing shit into a truck and he's like i look at him and i'm like next year what do you really dude we're done this is this was enough and then two weeks later it was you know the, the the check to the Lance Armstrong Foundation was was good and and Kim and I you know we had a bunch of people just saying that was the best damn golf tournament I think I've ever been to you sh I, we you should keep doing this I think you can really grow this so that first year I had a hundred and I had a hundred and four golfers so to put it in uh, non golfers terms a normal golf tournament, remember this number, a normal golf tournament 
is 144 people. That's a full one day golf tournament. 144. That's 12 squared. Great. Okay, you got the number? Got you. So the first year I had 144. 104. 104, I'm sorry. 104. You were, you were under the average. I was under. Slightly under. Second year was, I could go to the notes, but I probably, I could probably get it pretty close, but I could probably go through the first five years without looking at my phone. 104, 156, so that's 12 over. 178, 202. Then the then that place said, you're done. We can't do this anymore. We don't have we, any more capacity. You have to, you have to, you got to figure something out. Spoke with that place and we went, we went two, two in one day, which they had never done. Sunnyvale Muni Golf Course. It was a Muni course in Sunnyvale. And I said, well, why can't you guys just put a group out in the morning and a group out in the afternoon? And he goes, what are you? No, that's insane. Well, let's try to figure it out. Can't we just sit down and see if we can do it? We sat down for an hour and he's like, yeah, we we could do it, but it would be a lot. Like, well, that's where I'm at. And he's like, okay. So you're four. I think it was 104, 156, 178. Then, oh, so it was 178. It was not 202. 104, 156, 178. That's when he said, you're done. We can't go anymore. Have you, have you ever heard of that golf course in, in Sunnyvale? Uh, not only have I heard of it, I've played it several times. Yeah. Because I used to work in Sunnyvale in the early 2000s uh, off Lawrence Expressway at East Arquez. And we used to do uh, pre-dawn tee times before starting work. And we would play at the Sunnyvale Muni course that Bob's talking about. You want to know why Sun the Sunnyvale Muni course is still alive? Because people like Bob Hammer had a vision. Mm. And the employees fought him the whole time. Good for you, Bob. You well, kept Sunnyvale Muni alive. Hey, shout out Sunnyvale Muni. You owe this man a check. I was about to say that th I thought this wasn't about Ralph Barcy and his golfing career. but It's not. He, <coughs> what golfing career? <laughs> exactly. <It's laughs> the only thing that Ralph Barcy has on golf is his head looks like a golf ball. That's it. <laughs> okay, wow. So we're back. So... Um, <laughs> We digress. That, that we next digress. year, we tried doing 288. So that would be 144, 144. So we, we just stopped it at 288. So that year, year four was 288. Wow. And then it went to, well, the next year, well, we could probably fit a couple more in. Let's try 304. Or I think, I think we did 310. Let's say we did 310. And then it was like, let's really, let's... Let's really push it, like 320. Let's so see what we can do. Let's see one, what we can do. 160, 160. So you're overbooked in the morning and you're overbooked in the afternoon. And then that, that guy was like, dude, seriously, you can't do this anymore. So he, then we... He wasn't, he wasn't having a ball with it. So that was no. about the time that I moved. My wife and I moved to Danville. And we got a house here. And within a, within a few months... What year? That was 2008. So five, six, seven, eight. Got it. So now by 2009, I had been living in Danville, and we drove down to Sunnyvale. And uh, we were up at the Crow Canyon Country Club, and we started making some friends, and bring, they would bring us up there. And, and um, the, uh, the general manager at the time heard about the golf tournament, and he looked it up, and he's like, comes down to my buddy Ian. He's like, where's this Bob Hammer dude? I need to talk to this guy. And he like literally just walks right up to me. Hey, how you doing? I'm Mike. How are we, can we, can I sit down for a sec? So I need to figure out what I need to do to get part of your 300 people here at Crow Canyon. Now that you're here in Danville. Okay. That that's a lot of your stories. Okay. Okay. So, as if it's just some kind of like force of nature hitting you like a wave. What a disingenuous representation. You work for years, and all of a sudden, okay. That's. Yeah. Don't. I mean, look, think of a young person listening to this. Yeah. It's almost like it just happened to you 
It, I didn't want it. I didn't see it coming. It just happened. What a crock of crap, man. If you think of it that way, yes. If you Look, maybe you were not working that day. Maybe you were actually just hanging out at the club. But how long did, like, look, if you think about the motivations for you to be running this golf tournament, it goes back to your youth. Yeah. And for you to say some guy walks up to you and says, you know, I want some of your people, and you're like, okay. You have, what, four decades at this point? Yeah. Of living with this and, and, and committing yourself to this and understanding the drive. I mean, look, I'm not going to tell you to say, remember it differently, but. Okay. Okay. Come on, just keep going. I don't even know why I said anything. No, Come but I, I agree. I, I don't disagree. But everybody has a different upbringing. And when you, you know, when, when, you're, when your mom dies and your dad's not really around and shit happens to you at that young of an age and you're. I'm 16 years old and I'm working full time at a car lot and my I was I had to go buy a house because after my mom died uh my sisters and I got part of the house that we were that I grew up in and now I'm 16 years old and I got to I got to go buy a house with my other sister because she was single at the time and we had the money and Let's go buy a house at Redwood Shores. Okay. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> so you just go do that, and then it was and then, up. But she was like a she was a executive vice president of a national sales. She was a national sales manager for a company, and she was traveling all the time. And she was making X, and I was making eight bucks an hour, and we split the mortgage. Which, looking back, she did that on purpose to me to try to teach me some values of where you need to be in your life and what you need to do and what's more, what is important and how to structure things appropriately going forward. So I think, I think when that hits you a certain amount of times, you kind of just like roll with it. Like, okay. Bob. Uh, so going back, go on, I'm sorry. Keep going. Go ahead. No, I, Okay. I'm in. What one of the most uh one of the most intense realizations I've had over the last several years has been that death is an incredible wingman. And it's a uh, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. I have three boys, very luckily, and I have a, a wonderful wife and and I think a lot about as I'm sure a lot of people have in recent times just the end when it's coming I I had students in my class today I was talking about the, one girl was wearing a Nirvana shirt and I was giving her a hard time for it and you know they're fashionable I'm not but the point is I'm giving her a hard time for this shirt right. and make a joke about Kurt Cobain but the, the, the point of, of the thought is look it's coming it's coming what did you do and it's such a cliche, dumb thing that it's like, oh, you know, if you died today, would you be proud? I think that's such a disingenuous thought for most young people. I could die today and be happy. Shut up, man. You don't have anything to worry about. If you died today and you're 16, you'd be sad that your parents would be sad. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe you'd be like, yeah, forget my parents because you're a cranky 16-year-old, right? Like, you've got to take into account these are not fully formed ideas. But when you're in your 30s or 40s and you have kids that rely on you and need things from you that they don't even understand yet because they haven't gotten to the point in their mid-20s when they have an, a Maylox moment in life and they're like, oh, my God, I have to talk to my dad. Mm -hmm. They need right. things from you that you know they'll need. And they will not understand until they get to that point. When you think about, today could be my last day, it means something different, and it guides you in a different manner. I know it, it guides me. I shouldn't speak for you, but that's what I've been thinking this entire time, which is when you confront these kinds of, these kinds of beasts at a young age and then continue to see them 
and deal with them through your whole life as you have more and more layers of obligation and potential regret and, and life. How do you manage having that wingman sitting next to you every day? You just brought up the word obligation, which is um, one of the one of the one things that I've taken from the Lance Armstrong Foundation. That was the very first time that I ever went to an event, uh, and I went with my buddy Stephen Seaweed. He was a longtime disc jockey for. 1077 The Bone. I was going to say, I know that name. 1077 The Bone. He um, he had had cancer at the same, relatively the same time. We ended up, we'll have to, we can sidebar for two minutes. You go for ten minutes, baby. We go, uh, nothing but time. Uh, he's, I'm, I'm at work, and it's 1999. I mean, I like literally just had cancer. And he's talking on the radio about the Lance Armstrong Foundation. He goes, Any, anybody know anything about it? Give me a call. I call one eight hundred. The bone. Okay. And okay. Okay. <laughs> and the girl, you know, answers the phone. I go, yeah, I know it's about Lance Armstrong, and she goes, okay. So she puts me through this. You know, he's he's on he's he's got a lapse, and I, I go, yeah, I'm actually going to be going to the Lance Armstrong Foundation later this year. I've been raising some funds for him right now, and. He, and he goes, oh, okay, good, it's cool. You're, you're a big cyclist then? No, I'm a big cancer guy. I have cancer and I'm dying. And he's like, oh, well, hold on, let me, hold on, let me call you back in a minute. What's your phone number? I'm like, yeah, okay, dude, it's, you know, some disc jockey guy, right? He calls me, like he, get, he got off of work at, he had to 10 to 3, everybody who knows Stephen Seaweed, he got off at 3 o'clock, he called me at 3.02. Hey, Bobby, tell me a little bit about what's going on. That turned into him literally the next day. Showed up at my house with all this 1077 The Bone shit. He called my wife that morning. She answered the phone. He said, something just stuck with your husband. I just... I want to I want to stop by and see you guys. So he drove, and he lived in Los Gatos. He worked in San Francisco, lives in Los Gatos. Drove to my house, knocked on the door with all this shit. Bobby Hammer, Stephen Seaweed, one oh seven seven the Bone. How are you? <laughs> like, <laughs> you talk like that in real life. Oh my God! <laughs> right, and he was making a joke, and he came in, and we shot the shit for an hour, and became friends and and he called me a couple days later about well you need to go bike riding with me now if you're going to if you're going to beat this thing you got to you got to get in shape son you can't just sit on your ass and so I did I started biking with Steven Seaweed and him and I his best friend was Doug Sovereign from KCBS radio um so I'd go riding with these guys in the afternoon with the, uh, and um Became good friends with them. And um, we ended up going to Texas together, and they were there at the table when I met Dr. Craig Nichols. And they were there the, you know, the night that I was, when I was crowned the Livestrong champion for the Western United States, and I did a uh, speech at the Nike headquarters in front of 1,100 people. They were there. So it's a good story there. Tell me about the obligation. So when you said the obligation, it, it's um, it's a cancer phrase that kind of synonymous with a lot of cancer people, but not a lot of people. Cancer. When you get cancer, there's there's a couple ways you can go with it, right? There is. I just need to deal with my my own personal battles, and I want to be left in my room and. And I'm not gonna. I just, I don't want to talk about this with anybody. And and I'm and I'm, I am 100% behind all of those people. My mom was a recluse. My mom had um, what I le- later learned was called I think it was called agor- agoraphobia. Didn't want to leave the house. So I understand that whole thing. And and 
when I was going through my own treatments and um, I, I literally, I was in the bathroom and I was puking my guts out at like round 25 and this, 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 uh, this woman walked in who I, I'm still friends with today and, and, uh, she was, you'll be all right. And then we started talking and, and, um, she was the first person who ever said it to me. She goes, you're the kind of, you're the kind of kid I, I can, I've just, I've talked with you a little bit. You're going to be that kid who has the obligation. I go, okay. And I'm like, oh yeah, right. And she goes, no, no. She goes, it's the obligation of the cured. And I'm, you know, I'm, I kind of looked at her and I go, okay. Okay. <laughs> and I let it sink in from it, like the obligation of the cure. What is that? What does that mean? And later, a few years later at the Lance Armstrong thing, after I was, um, we were at one of these events and, and a gentleman from Can American Cancer Society, let's say, he called it the obligation of the cure. And, Kind of ding, and um, when I when I was in my shed in the back of my house thinking about how I could try to do something, I mean, here I am, I'm cured, and and my little my little little Josh is running out from the from the kitchen, and Daddy, and you know, I I got to do something. What do I? Obligation of the cured. What is that? What can I do? That's when the, then there's the, there's the, there's the Chuck Stancil and you go figure out the golf tournament. There's the, the light bulb in the, you know, watching ESPN at 11 o'clock at night. There's the light bulb of, huh, maybe I should try that golf tournament thing. Right. And then kind of, it took me a year and a half to put that first golf tournament together because I'm the kind of person that if I'm going to do something, I'm. I think I'm a little bit like you. If I if I do something, or her, or him, if I'm in, I'm all the way freaking in, and I'm not gonna do anything half-assed. So let's go, right? So I started putting a plan together, and then you start putting a plan in place, and then it took a year and a half to do that first one. And I thought if it was successful, I could try to do another, but I mean, here we are now so that that's the story and here we are now 16 years later and your next question would be dude you've been doing it for 16 years how much how long are you going to do it and, my next and, question was actually going to be uh have you seen the mandalorian on disney plus but you can answer that your question first, which is a great then, question thank you thank you it's I an excellent it. question it's a wonderful show but you answer sure. your question first no no well look hold so, on let yes. me finish that because Please. i would like to then i'd like to there's there's a couple reasons why it keeps going one is you meet people and and you when we stopped giving money to just the Lance Armstrong Foundation and then we sent money to a place called the first one was first one was I was watching a Giants game shortly after we created our foundation and they were talking about this little camp up in Nevada called Camp Okaisu well, it's a camp for kids with cancer, and what they do is, and I was like, huh, God, if I ever raise enough money with this thing that I'm doing, I could, we could probably try to help them. And Kim's like, yeah, okay, your soup's ready, dill hole. <laughs> so a couple of years later, and, and Kim and I privately talked, and we kind of saw the writing on the wall a little bit with, well, we've already kind of, we've we've done our thing with, this we were the i mean the live strong challenge was created in texas and then they expanded to philadelphia and then they expanded to the next place on the west coach because he was sponsored by nike would be beaverton oregon so they did it in portland and then the next place they expanded to was the bay area because there was this thing called the have a ball foundation who had just given them i don't know 
three hundred thousand dollars in the last two and a half years. Wow. So so they did the they they created one in the Bay Area. So naturally I'm this is where I'm a little bit like you. Naturally when they announced that it's going to be in the Bay Area, I'm going to win this. (laughs) I can't have the first annual inaugural Lance Armstrong event in the Bay Area and my freaking son is here because of his foundation and I've started my own foundation because of the whole freaking story yeah we're we're gonna need to win that we're gonna need to I'm, I'm gonna need to put a pin in this we're gonna need to win that so we did but then after that it was kind of like we had heard of other foundations we had heard of other stories we had heard of you know we're not it's not just about testicular cancer. Everybody got have a ball, cool, funny, but then it kind of got a little bit more serious. Like we are, we're, we're like, we're really helping some people. Like we're four years in, and it took you four years to figure that one out. No, no. Okay. No, I I picked up on that that first day when KTVU showed up. The very first golf tournament that I ever did, out of a garage, and KTVU called at two thirty, like. Hey, could you be live on the five o'clock news? Uh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, no, I, I look, picked up on it pretty quick, and after a couple of years, though, then it kind of became, let's see what we could do with other. So we just cut a check for five thousand dollars to this camp of Kaizu. Didn't know anything about they. They didn't know anything about us. I knew a little little bit about them them check goes to their place I get a call from this guy John like Tuesday after the check goes in John Bell founded Camp Okaizu in 1966 kind of thing and it's been his own little creation he goes yeah so I was just looking you up Bob and I'd I'd really love to go just have coffee with you can we go meet okay so we, you know, but look, you go meet, you go meet John at Camp Okaizu, and then you go meet Tina at the HERS Breast Cancer Foundation. You go meet Kim Bellinger right here at the John Muir Health Foundation. Um, we've we've done we've done. One of the greatest things that we've done is, the guy who treated me. You heard the story about the twenty six rounds of chemo. The guy who treated me was his name was Fred Marcus. Never smoked a day in his life, cured hundreds of people of cancer, died of cancer. Of lung cancer, never smoked. He died at like 54 years old. He died about seven years after I started the... No, 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 I can't be that. He died two years after I started the foundation. And... We need... Yeah, we need to do something. So we started... We started our own scholarship called the Fred S. Marcus Memorial Scholarship, and it's at Sequoia Hospital. They are paired up with the UCSF Nursing School. So we've given away 14 oncology nursing scholarships through Sequoia Hospital and the UCSF Hmm. nursing program to oncology nursing students. I mean, that's good stuff. It doesn't, you know, it's just obligation of the cure. But hold on, where, uh, let me, so, but the next phase of it is, so it, 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 it blossoms, right? And it, it starts with this little thing in a garage, right? And and I'm still, well, I just did an interview today on KPIX. Vernon Glenn just came out. I went to my storage shed and he filmed all the shit and it's like, yeah, it's the obligation of the cure and still out of a garage, but it it's more because when when it when it expands, you you get touched by other people and then, the network grows and the tree grows and then you meet but it it, but then you meet other people you meet like corporate people you meet corporate sponsors and you meet then you know their corporate sponsors families and then and then it becomes even more personal with like your your hometown like right now here today right your your next door neighbor across the hall from you 
is one of my dear friends. You've never met her before, Tiffany Stewart. She's the owner of Dynamic Office and Accounting. She didn't know me for Adam probably nine years ago now, eight years ago. One of her friends brought her to the event. No, you coached Sophia in soccer. Oh, that's right. And you invited me. Uh, it was also Elliot, open spot. but it was also Elliot. But yeah, that's right. I coached her daughter in softball. No, or you, soccer. In, you introduced me to Elliot. You coached Sophia in soccer. See, the networking tree is too convoluted. It's Metcalf's law. But look. But you he's meet talking people. about laws. Hell, here You're talking comes. about real interpersonal relationships. Right. Like, there's this abstract concept. I'm it's trying to bring Triff and Tiffany into the conversation. But yeah, that's right. I coached her daughter. If I, if I may, Bob. Yeah. Uh, the the reason that I actually wasn't joking about Mandalorian. I don't know. I don't know if you've seen the show, but no. It's it's a wonderful show, actually, and. One of the big things that they emphasize is being a Mandalorian. It's like these hired mercenaries, right? Bounty hunters, mercenaries. And they're not, it's not a race, it's creed, right? And that's the big emphasis, that there's this creed, there's this agreement. And they, they, keep, they keep emphasizing the concept of this is the way, right? Whenever they're, whenever they're contemplating a difficult endeavor, they're like, hey, this is the way. And... The Mandalorian, the main character, goes out and has these smaller jobs that he does, and he makes a certain amount of money, and there's this type of metal that, essentially like a gold or a platinum that he's paid in, that's very specific to the Mandalorian armor that was essentially robbed from them in the great fall of the Mandalorian Empire. And as they, as they do these jobs and are paid in this metal, the the Mandalorians essentially elect to tax themselves and they bring it to the to the forger and they they get new armor or new weapons but donate part of it and that's that's the way this okay. is the way and they keep talking about the foundlings and you realize very quickly in the in the series that when these when these individuals that are highly honorable, highly competent, and highly dangerous talk about the foundlings, they're talking about taking in people, taking in young people that have no one, that are essentially orphans, that have, that have nothing, it's rescuing them. And you find out later that that's how this individual became a Mandalorian. He was rescued, his parents were murdered, and this Mandalorian came in and rescued him from these evil empire people. And that has, that has struck me so hard. It, it meant so much to me to consider that because in my own life, I considered myself very much a foundling in the sense that I've had people that have stepped in and helped me and, and done things for me and, and guided me to better decisions and, and essentially rescued me. I, there was a time I was going to Ignacio Valley High School of all dynamite academic institutions and I was a senior and I, I went and saw at one point I went and saw my, my swim coach and I was like yeah all of my applications just got rejected from college because that, the test score company sent the wrong test score code to the colleges so none of the applications got received I just got denials from every single school now mind you I didn't call my mom. I didn't call my dad. I went to see this swim coach in the middle of school saying, hey, this is what I got this morning. And That would be why we're in this room right here. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out, Kevin. Uh, yeah. But the point is this guy helped me through that. And mm -hmm. you can imagine as a 17-year-old who didn't have parents that were watching over his shoulder yeah. to have somebody say, hey, listen to me right now. Give me your attention. This is what you're going to do. And to, to see that type of relationship and then to know that's primarily my obligation to my students, which is, hey, look, I don't know who's walking through my door. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're coming from. I don't know if they're coming from a great family, from a terrible family, from no family, from money, from no money. It doesn't matter to me. They're in my room now. I found them. 
They're my people. What are you going to do with them? I have an obligation mm -hmm. to help them because I was helped. That's, that's so fundamental in the way that I behave, but I feel like so many people look past that. How did you see that? How did you see that? Did, we, live in a, we live in a community that is hyper successful. To imagine that all of the people here just inherited that, that's foolish. That's foolish. We have people that work to the bone, but we also have people that had a little help, just a little guidance. My swim coach didn't get me through Cal. He didn't build my tutoring company. He didn't do all these things. He grabbed me on March 28th or 29th of my senior year and said, hey, look at me, look at me. This is what you're going to do right now. That one moment, mm -hmm. that one moment was impactful. But we don't have enough people in our community of hyper successful people that obviously earned it, recognizing the people that saw them and found them and helped them. They don't feel that obligation enough. And maybe they do. I'm not judging. That's not, that's not what I'm doing. You got to realize it's, I don't know everyone's story. I didn't know yours until now, right. but I do know we need more of it. And more of it only comes from people realizing, <clears throat> damn it, man, this person, without this person, without that moment on that day, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have done this. I have to be that person for someone else. How do we instill that? How do we bring that to the community? How do we look past our immediate hyper success and help other people, our peers, find that person or understand that obligation without health problems? Right. It's, all, it's easy, it's well and fine to say, hey look, this happened to me and I saw my life flash before my eyes. How do we get people to love other people without seeing their life flash before their eyes? Great question. We're going to solve it right now, Bob. Okay. We're going to solve it, Bobby. Probably okay. Get Let me help you with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me introduce Tiffany Stewart. Hmm. Let me introduce Tiffany Stewart, who is across your hall and you've never met before. And, um, but she's a prime example of when you have something and it grows and you realize that you want this to continue to grow, but you need you need other people to help. You need other people to be a part of your tree. She's involved in, in our foundation for Kim and I, but she's involved in, I'm gonna guess, she's probably pretty involved, like like involved meaning she has a, a a piece of her heart or her company's money one or the other or both and i'm going to guess 18 to 22 different organizations that she could probably name off pretty quick and it's it's just you meet a good person and and i'm i i think that i think i think i'm a good so far, I'm only 52, but I think I've so far I've I've gotten pretty good at being a pretty good judge of, of people, and you, and you meet somebody and you get to talk with them a little bit, and where I'm going with it is you get you meet other wonderful people, and I'm not saying I'm wonderful. I'm hey, saying you meet you meet wonderful people. Game recognizes game, baby. No, 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 no. I didn't. I, that sounded horrible. I didn't mean you. No, no, I, mean, I thought that was a good line. Was great. You, I thought that was you meet line. wonderful people. No, not your line, my line. You, no. <laughs> your line was good. Thank but you. But no, you me. want you want to you want to be able to network with those people and and try to find a way to to help each other. Right? And okay. It's that was too hard. I'm sorry. A little softer next That's time. That's what she said. Could I say that? You did say that. I couldn't hear that one. I don't have the I headphones. I have the headphones on. Everything I'm saying is amplified. Tiffany, come on. Well, so I'm going to tell you when I met Bob, I've been a single mom for a really long time, and he was an amazing soccer coach. I wouldn't. Okay. 
I'm not saying because we won all the time. I'm talking about because well, he inspired kids every single day. And he pushed them and he was just awesome. Jesus Christ. And what Bob, I don't think, realizes is that when he invited me, he said, hey, you golf, right? We're at a soccer thing and you golf, right? And I go, yeah, and he goes, I've got an opening and you want to play? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. I played. What he didn't know is that I watched my dad die of cancer for 18 months and I, he died when I was 15 years old. And I lived with him and so it was a really, really, really painful time because that was where I lived. So it was really a life changing event at, a, at that age. And you fast forward 12 months later, my grandma died, I lost probably 11 people of my friends and family in a 12 month period. And so Bob's inspiration and all the things that he does, it overwhelms me because I see the impact that he makes with so many people. And my son's had a really great opportunity because he's been able to come out and volunteer and do things and he learned things that I don't think he would have ever really learned. Maybe he would learn them, but I don't know that he really understands the impact that it had on me personally because of what I went through with my dad. My dad had colon cancer and died. My mom had colon cancer and survived. My aunt had cancer. She's had probably six or seven different types and she is still surviving and she's in her 80s. So I've been around that for a really long time and so to be able to be around so many people that are so inspirational around such a just a awful sickness, right? That can't be controlled. It doesn't discriminate. Right, it doesn't care about who has kids, who doesn't have kids. It doesn't care about who has family, who doesn't have family. It doesn't care. It just, it hits people and it affects everybody in this big ripple effect. And Bob's had the opportunity and the ability to make that same ripple effect in helping all those people. And yeah, it's uh, incredible. And it, it could, it goes even, so, you start this thing and you get your you get your network right. I'm I'm talking here. You get your network and you grow the network and it grows and grows and grows. But then you meet somebody, Tiffany, and you become a, you become a friend with with her and 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 you become a friend with the family and 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 then she wants advice and and I go and I we go I go grab Presley and we just go shoot the crap one day at a hamburger spot right and it, it's it's those connect it what keeps it what keeps it going is the connections like she's she's it was absolutely wonderful that she is across your hall she's a perfect example of why why would you keep doing it and and what is and what makes it work what makes it work? Why keep doing it? And where are you going to go with it? I think it. I, I think it goes much deeper than that. In fact, and it comes back to the joke in my mind. It comes back to the joke I make. It's like, hey, look, your parents were not thinking about you, and they had you. Yeah. They were thinking about themselves, right? Because, because what a horrific experience life is. And we all end up dying in the end. Either you go, yeah. you leave the party before all of your friends, and that's not fun, or you're the last person at the party seeing everyone leave, and that's horrific as well. And I always try to emphasize to my students, it's like, hey, look, th you got to toughen up, because guess what? Although this is a joke, it's not necessarily not true. <laughs> and they realize very quickly oh, you're actually right. Like, you're not joking. Yeah, no, I'm not joking. This is a horrific experience that we're in. But you see a lot of people, a lot of people, especially now, that were capable of having a degree of disengagement from society that allows individuals who are suffering or tormented by life to completely detach and go off into oblivion. They, they, they're, they're not pulled forward to produce, right? Like if we lived in a hunter-gatherer society, there were a hundred of us or 50 of us, and one of us got sick, 
yeah, look, for a certain amount of time, people would take care of you. But after that, hey, look, you got to, we got to get on with it. We got to, there was a, a beautiful Leonardo DiCaprio movie actually called The Beach. I don't know if any of you saw it. It's, it's bananas, right? So Leonardo's in, you know, Singapore or some junk and they find, he hears from this rumor about this, this island that's, you know, all they do is grow marijuana and it's, it's an older movie. But the point is he goes, he goes on this boat and they find these marijuana fields and then they, they run from these drug lords because it turns out, oh, it wasn't growing marijuana for no reason, right? And they dr- run and they find this beach. Where's the, the beach with marijuana? It's off the coast of Singapore. The point is, he he becomes part of <laughs> he becomes part of this community in Singapore, or excuse me, off the coast of Singapore, not in Singapore, off the coast of Singapore. That is this like commune. This is like hunter gather. Like they are allowed to live there by the drug lords as long as they don't do anything and they make money. That essentially the drug lords pay for all of their fish and their whatever. But so as long as they're productive. As long as they are productive and they don't mess with anyone, they can live there. But the point is that they have this relationship with each other where, hey, look, there are no freeloaders. There are no freeloaders. If you're not hunting for fish in the ocean, if you're not cultivating this crop, if you're not doing these things, we have no space for you because you, we, we, just, we don't have the capacity to care or, or take in people like that. Right. And that's quite unfortunately the, the society we have. We, we can allow people to fall between the cracks and go into oblivion when contemplating their navels and the, and the evils of the world, right? Like we all could sit around and think about how horrific it is that, you know, that being a parent is like this or being a child is like this or being a human being, the state of existence is like this. And you find some people who say, yeah, it could be that. I'm not taking anything away. You want to sit in a dark room and just plot yeah. your destruction of the world. I'm not even going to take that away from you. You want to be some recluse, fine. You're mm-hmm. entitled to that. But I have a different path. I have a different obligation. I have a different thought in the world, right? Because we could also do great things in the world. We could also find ways to help people. We could also delve deeply into our own fears and try to eliminate those in other people. I mean, it's one of those, it's one of those very unfortunate but valid positions that we have as human beings. Why is it unfortunate? Okay, could we imagine a world where people weren't justified in sitting around and thinking about how horrific the world is. This is going deep. I need a beer. Get a beer. Because I think we could. And what, okay, an invalid position. Life is suffering. Everything is terrible. I'm going to make the world worse for everyone else. Which is such a weird thought process. A weird but not uncommon. A weird but where do you think where do you think school shootings come from? These are not people that feel heard, valued. They, these are not people who see a path or feel compassion or feel love from other people. That's not what it is. Right? It is, but that's also the problem that people have not seen that person for what they are and reached out to them and pulled them along. Because, you know, when one hand is reaching down, right, one hand reaches up. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I don't understand. What I'm saying is, we have enough. Look, this is what I'm saying, okay? You have, you have a capacity in the world. In the present day, let's say California, you have a capacity in present day to be upset at the world and the pain of the world and not be cast out from society. Okay, if we were in hunter-gatherer times and people are sitting around upset about, you know, the, 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 the state of the snake bite or something, it's like, look, that's, that's all well and fine, but you've got to participate with us here because we got to go because, you know, we're hunter-gatherer, we, don't, we can't. But we have such abundance and, and capacity now that people can 
sit about, contemplate their navel, get down on the world, and be really upset to the point of tragedy. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we need to avoid. And because we have this state of the world where people can be dark and upset and gloomy, that's what happens. But I don't know that I find that acceptable. No. At all. Of course. Of course it's not acceptable. It's horrific. It's terrifying. It's the... But that is the state of human existence today. That's what we breed in some very real sense. We breed the enabling, the capacity for people to sit around and be upset. No, it's not okay. But we don't breed that. You and others might. <laughs> I never breeded that. How do you not breed that? Do you pay your taxes? I pay my taxes and I also absolutely pushed my children to be productive. Yes. They needed to be doing things. They needed to be participating in things that were good things. They needed to be making some kind of impact that was not so self-focused. The problem today is, is that people are so self-focused that they don't look around and see that somebody's hurting or that maybe something's wrong. They don't take a moment to look around and go, you know what, maybe my life is not perfect, but wait a second, I'm looking at that person, man. They look like they could use like just a little, like a little lift, like just a gift of hope or a friendly conversation. Yes, but Tiffany, you're talking about your relationship with individuals as a mother and child. We, we don't have the capacity to talk to other individuals in our community in general in that capacity. Don't you think we have a responsibility though with kids, whether they're ours or not, to have those conversations? Okay, that's a great question. I feel but like we do. Perhaps. But could you imagine another parent coming up to your kids mm -hmm. and trying to convince them that, that, that your children need to see the world as this other individual sees it instead of the way you see it? I don't think it's about convincing. I think it's about dropping nuggets of information that could be impactful because like you said, sometimes it takes one conversation to change something or to give somebody that gas or lift or whatever it is that makes them drive, drive, make All right. them change Great. the world. Let's do a less positive convincing. Hey, you're going to die, sucker. You might die tomorrow. And by the way, on the way to your death, there's going to be nothing but disappointment and pain. You might live to be 100 years, see every single person you know die along the way. And in the end, you might lose the only thing that's yours, your mind. I now am look, glad I am not inside your head. <laughs> I am glad I don't my, live in there. My point this is, went. listen to me, listen yeah, this, to me. This, this went. It's not fair to give that, the reins over to strangers in our community to take control of our children. It's not about control. It's no, about but input. Fine. Do you want me inputting that crazy stuff into your kid's head? No. That's, that's poison. That's poison. So my point is you're conveying a thought process that should be instilled from a parent to a child. And what I'm saying is that thought process should be unique to you. Nobody's walking up to my kid and telling them how they should see the world or how they should see their obligation to the world on their way to their ultimate demise. That's my job. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> because listen, it's freeing. That's the flip side of that. Look, no, listen, demise? listen, hear me out. We're all going out. <laughs> We're all going out. So if you're thinking that you're somehow avoiding the hand that human beings have been dealt, which is our end, you're foolish. And that's the beauty. That's the freeing nature of being a human being. We're here for a very, very tiny short period of time. We're this animated crap out of the earth. And we're here now. And we're moving around and wiggling and doing all this stupid crap. And we're driving cars and using toilet paper and whatever it is we're doing, right? And that's the beauty of being a human being. And the best part of being a human being is you know how painful it is to be alive. And if you try, you can minimize that pain for other people. 
you can make it a slightly less painful experience. That's the only valuable thing that any of us can do. I'm not gonna have any impact on the world. I'm not gonna have any impact on Danville, but I may have an impact on a kid that left my class today that seemed really tired and out of it. And I text that student and say, hey, are you all right? Do you need some money for some food? Do you need a coffee? What do you need? And the kid texts back and they're like, I'm okay, Matt. I'll was make that it. my son, Josh? It was not. He did not okay, come in today. Oh, okay. okay. That's all we can do. But that impact that you've made with that kid that day, they might go out and reproduce that 20-fold in the world. Yes. Yes. Fine. Fine. Right? I'm 100% on board with that. And that's yep, the nature of the experience. But like, That's I the was, nature of what we do. I, think I only... She, I'm sorry, what was No, no, no. Well, when you walked out, one of the things that I said is somebody told me a very great saying. Because I said, you know, life is short because I've had all this death in my life at such a young age. And all I could think about was like, everybody I would meet, I just assumed that they would be dead or going out of my life very rapidly. I lived like that for years. And I was able to change that thought process. But later, somebody said to me, yeah, life is short, but it can also be really long. So how are you going to live it? And it's so true because you know what? You can wake up every day and make some kind of really great impact and not think about your end, but actually think about, I'm going to make the most impact I possibly can and do the best things I possibly can and interact in the most positive ways that I can for the duration of the time that I am here. Like that's a gift right there. You just pointed to it though. It's a gift. It's not a universal thought process. I think process. that's where he's trying to go. And there what, are plenty I, of people that get frustrated and jaded and upset with the pain of the world. And they're not invalid. It is a terrible existence to be human being. It's terrible here. Right? Like, you gotta, you gotta recognize that somebody who's upset and scarred and just miserable and hurting, it's not like they're unique. We all have these experiences to some degree, but I find it to be my obligation to try to help other human beings see through that dark forest. I'm in 100% alignment. I don't know that I think everything is a dark forest. I think right. that some are more dark than others. I think we're, You I, two are both talking about horrific cancers and deaths. What are you talking about? It's not a dark forest. Because we're alive. Well, because we were just on a dark, dark path through you for the last 11 minutes. So where I think I'm going to go, where I think I'm going to dial it back just a little bit and bring it back to like 11 minutes ago before we went down this, where, where, where this went. You ever turn down the contrast no. on a TV? The picture looks like crap, okay. doesn't okay. it? Listen but you have the me. ability to turn it back up. Right. No, what? Okay. Listen, if you don't have contrast in life, if you don't know what the alternative is, what's the point of going on sure. like this? Look, you're an exceptional guy, Bobby. You're an exceptional guy. Why are you exceptional? Because you contrast to the rest of us mere mortals. Right? Um. You want to convince your kids to do the right thing? Mm -hmm. Show them what doing the wrong thing looks like. You don't have to convince anyone. Hey, okay. you don't want to tell me the truth? This is what all of us lying to each other looks like. If you want to reproduce that world, get after it, son. Here it comes. Well, no, th th this this whole rabbit hole that you went down for the last few minutes started with obligation, and I think where you were, I think where you started with, you were trying to make a you were trying to make a point that some people are. You were, I think where you were trying to go originally was like some people seem to be the exception, not the rule, and they kind of, but. I wanted to make a rebuttal like immediately to what you were saying just the in the fact that just because somebody does something when they call it the obligation of the cured and they actually go out and do it it doesn't mean that the person who went through 26 rounds of chemo and almost died but didn't I that that person to me is the same person that I am they just chose not to try to do something about it i believe you I, and i agree with it, you it's just you a, get your position is a hundred percent valid that person's you not a bad person you and don't he's not going to die in a slow no. immortal painful death in a 
going to cross. If if I conveyed that somebody you, picking a different life you path, you kind of did. I think I said several times it's a valid position. Okay. If I didn't, let me let me repeat. Okay. You don't have to be you. You don't have to be Bobby. You don't have to be Tiffany. You don't have to be Ralph. You don't have to be Matt. But I see. I see it as our obligation to try to steer the conversation for the world at large, the world, in a more positive light. That's it. Okay. That's all I got. Okay. And when I see somebody like you or like Tiffany or like Ralph who understands the nature of human existence as this painful, difficult, unyielding burden that we carry until our end, which it is, and it behooves none of us to imagine that it's not. That's death as a wingman. That's death as your best friend. That's death right beside you, reminding you, this is hard. This is terrible. But it can also be beautiful. And helping each other navigate this is should be, in my mind, it should be our primary objective. To, to have a good life and imagine that life is good for everyone, you're a fool. You're a fool. To have a good life and realize, wow, I'm having a good life in spite of the landmines to the left and to the right. Mm -hmm. That's reality. And say, hey, I if I could help this kid or help this person navigate through the minefield, like I somehow have had the good fortune of doing, that's my obligation. That's the point. Right. That's that, the point. That sounds much more uplifting when you're talking about not helping somebody else navigate something that you've dealt with. You or could just delete that else. like 11 minute thing that you did. And I never delete shit. Bob. Well, you're talking to people who collectively stay in the sunlight. What do you, you know mean? what I mean? So what when, do you mean, Ralph? So when well, you say um, exactly what he says. Yeah, exactly what I said. That's what I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. So the entirety of Ralph's point can be captured in like a, what, a 10 word sentence? Right. By the oh, way, okay. it was coined by. He's pretty amazing. It was coined by Ben Franklin. I'm not plagiarizing. I, I'll reference who I'm. Who I'm uh, Great. Well, d do this. Do me a solid. Explain to me what Ben meant. And then maybe the <laughs> listeners will understand <laughs> what you meant if you, got, if you could just do me a solid. Well, it's funny because you said earlier, probably 20 minutes ago now, that um, we can't make an impact on the world. Well, if you feel you can't make an impact on the world, you're right. You, you can't. can't. Damn it, Tiffany. I hate that you knew where he was going with that. You know, but if I seem like such a fool all of a sudden. No, not at all. No, not I'm at just all. saying I think, you know, what we do have control over is our interpretation of the events that happen to us. And you can you can interpret it negatively or positively. And you're talking to three people who interpret it positively by default. Based on life experience, right? So if you don't think you can change the world or you think, uh, you know, it's life is some, someone in demise and it's just a matter of time before they're gone, what, what a dark way to live life. But that's my point. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a dark way to live life. How fortunate that all four of us are sitting here enjoying each other's company. Ralph, one of my greatest friends. Bob, a newer friend. Tiffany, my newest friend. What an incredibly fortunate position to be in. What an incredibly fortunate position to be in. And it's only incredibly fortunate because you have your eye on the reality of it. Are Which is that it's dark Monday? and it's painful and it's hard. How incredible that we're sharing this time together. That's my point. And if you don't have your eye on your wingman, death sitting right beside you, you can't appreciate how remarkable it is that we find ourselves here right now, That's in fair. this moment. Without that, if you think the world is just sunshine and roses, why would tonight vary at all? It wouldn't. Look at this. <laughs> I don't That's think it's sunshine point. and roses, but I gotta tell That's you. That's my point. That's we my point. If we lived in Seattle, I mean, there would no. be a lot of things if we lived in Seattle. But if we lived in Seattle and we saw it rain every day and then the one day of sunshine came through, we would know how fortunate we were. Why is that any different? Why is it any different in life? 
you guys know it more than than I do, more than most people. Can you? He say only has one ball. Again? Well, I thought when you said you have to have an eye on it, I thought you noticed my lazy eye. I'm like, dude, really? He has you a lazy eye. Okay. I anyway, you sh can you repeat what you just said that Which I heard? Part? We all have to have a gift. We all have to give gifts. Yeah, we have to give gifts every single day. I mean, I believe that's our obligation in life. I believe that we are to give a gift, and I don't care what it is, all the time. Wait, wait. Finish that. What I, do you mean, give a gift? This isn't Christmas. What are you well, talking about? Well, you know what? It's not about that kind of gift. It's about making that connection. I walked out of my office, and he's standing in there, and he it's says, It's an unfortunate oh my gosh, turn of events. There. You walked out of your office, and he's there. I he's understand. He's there. Bob is there, and he's like, what are you? Oh, my God, I didn't realize you were here. And he gave me the gift. He invited me over here. He didn't need to give me that gift. He didn't give you a gift. He invited you into my space without asking me. There's no gift. That's, That's a gift. It doesn't matter. It's a gift because mm. now I can come over whenever I want to and I see your snack cabinet. I never so. had a MySpace account though, by the way. What? The what? MySpace account. MySpace. Okay. I know. So That's I know fine. Yeah, God, but I'm just saying just it's gifts himself? all the time. It's gifts all the time. It's having the opportunity to go give somebody a gift, whether it's a kind word, whether it's a smile, whether it's whatever, it doesn't and, matter and what it is. Tiffany, God bless you. And That's my point. Hang on, Bobby. This, you are proving my point. Why is it considered a gift? Why is it a gift you walk out of your office and see Bobby and Ralph and you come over here instead of walking out of your office and getting in a car accident? Why is it a gift? Because the alternative is possible at every moment. What a gift that you're here. It is a gift. But yes. but with that, it means I need to go continue doing that. Whether it's a smile, whether it's talking to somebody that looks down, whether it's actually sincerely asking somebody how they are. It doesn't matter what it is. It's about taking a little bit of extra time with anybody that you're talking to or that you're not talking to, that you're just walking by. I was in a huge car accident. We flipped four times end over end. My stepfather was killed on impact. My ex-husband was driving. My mom had 600 staples in her head. And I'm going to tell you, I walked away from that car accident. That was a gift. I don't look at it that it was, it was a horrible car accident. Th that's all true. But I, I got, I walked away with a gift. Like that's. I, it's how you I interpret at, things on, Bob, in hang on, life. Hang on, hang on. It's, it is it's the may. way you interpret life and it is also it's the way, the way you, you respond to the life. events that happened. It's how you react. There's not an event in this world that can happen that drives my response. I am in control of my own response and how I want to deal with something. Just because somebody walks up to me or something bad happens to me, because bad things happen to good people all the time. Mm -hmm. Just because that happens doesn't drive my response. And, and the gift I get to give, for example, to my kids and to their friends, is they get a choice to go respond to things any way they want to, just because whatever happens that's bad doesn't mean that they have to go respond to it in a bad way. Those are gifts. Those are all gifts. And, and every, I feel like we get to give them. And everybody takes everybody takes their own obligation, that which has kind of turned into the theme of the... But, but everybody's obligation doesn't mean that what they do with their obligation makes them a good or a bad person. If they, if they choose not to do something, even though they have the ability to do that thing and they don't do it, you, you, can't, you can't classify that person as an, immediately as a bad person because they didn't do the obligation. There might be a hundred other things that that person does that they don't even think of as an obligation, but they do it every day or they do it. And other people would see that as Damn, what is this guy doing? He's making me look. This guy's got a. What, what's he doing? And now he's what? He's fixing kids with cancer, and now he's doing the. This guy's a pain in my ass, right? Or what? You know what I mean? Just because one person does something, and and certain people people say, yeah, wow, that's really cool what you do. It it doesn't mean that the other person who has an obligation doesn't mean that that person doesn't do other wonderful things or has their own obligations that might, may or may not affect other people and make people a stronger person in a different way. Okay. 
I just went I, really. I think you agree. I, I just went. I couldn't. I, I just couldn't, went really deep right there. By I the way. couldn't. I couldn't agree with both of you more. I don't think we are actually disagreeing mm-hmm. at all. I don't either. I I think mm-hmm. the recognition that our great fortunes just by sitting here are an unparalleled gift, unparalleled in human existence, in that we have life. Yeah. It's true, and the the unabashed recognition and validation of different people's life choices. You don't have to overcome tragedy and walk away and say, well, I have to commit myself to, you know, a golf tournament or a this or a that. It doesn't, you don't have to do that. It's your life. It's your gift. I'm not going to judge you. If you survive cancer and you don't make a golf tournament, I don't think you're less than Bob Hammer. I don't, I don't think you're less of a person. I don't think you're less valued. I agree. I just don't think it behooves anyone to pretend that life isn't as, as raw as it is. It's raw. It's real, man. It is. You but know, in all every- the rawness of life, you need to grab every great moment you got to seize every single one of them because you don't know if it's not going to be there tomorrow. I hear people say to me, oh, don't, you know, you say happy birthday. And they're like, oh, God, don't talk to me. Now I'm like, I've got so much older. And it's like, you know what? If you're not having those birthdays. Those people suck. Those right, people they suck. They suck bad. Forget I'm like, it. Forget if you're those not people. Having, defriend them. Hashtag yeah. defriend. But I'm like, if you're not having birthdays, you're dead. Keep having birthdays. If you're not living, you're dying. Right? God bless you, Ralph. He's got all these like poster quality corporate sayings. It's his that hair. That might have been Ralph Farsi Senior did that one. Oh my god. <laughs> Ralph, may I ask you? <laughs> you are unrepentantly the most positive person I know. Positive and not foolish or naive. Let me be really clear. You're positive That's true. while having your eyes open. How do you navigate this? Because Those I get dark. I that, get a hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. He lives in the light, but he knows that there's shadow everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I go. I mean, I don't think I have to convince anybody that I no, believe in just, the shadow. We, we just heard it for yeah, a while. We know, you know your what, shadows. You know what, Bobby? Just take it easy. I'm talking to Ralph right now. Okay. How? How do you do that? You got to be present. You got to live in the moment. You have to develop and be aware of uh, your attitude of gratitude. We've talked about this before, Matt. So much. The fact that we're sitting in this room and I'm not in any pain. I could take a deep breath and nothing's bothering me. I could wiggle my fingers. You know, I'm not hooked up to an IV. I'm not trying to make it through tonight. Uh, I'm sitting here drinking a cold beverage. I'm not cold. I'm not hot. You know, I, I'm grateful for that and I'm aware of it. And to Bob's point earlier, because of that awareness, I feel an obligation is correlated to that. Where because I have what I have and because I'm aware of the present moment, that I must pay this forward somehow. And sometimes that means in a little glimpse or just a little pocket of time, if I can make someone's day just a smidge brighter than it was before they came into touch with me, then, uh, you know, I've served a purpose for the day and I've served a mission. So I know it sounds a little cheesy, but that's precisely how I live every day. If I wake up and, you know, my family's with me uh, and even knock on wood, some of them aren't. And I've lost people as well in my life who are very important to me, very special to me. But I, again, as we talked about, I interpret it as, Wow, what a gift that I got to be with them for as long as I did. And I got to learn from them, laugh with them, etc. cetera. Uh, that, you know, obligates me to pay that experience forward to someone who doesn't have what I have had or have today. It's really that simple. It's a pretty easy formula. Damn it, man. You make it seem so simple. Like life is just, it's like, hey, man, you just do good things to people and we're all better. If we all did good things to people, we would all be better. It's not even about being better, though, and it's not about what other people are thinking about what you're doing. It's just a way to live. 
because you right. feel better from the inside out. Well, it's a better way to live. Yeah, you just feel you feel better from the inside out, though. So it's about you. No. <laughs> actually, you know what? Actually, it makes me healthier. Well, you too. It actually, makes me healthier yeah. to to feel that way because I don't go to bed with a scowl on my face. I could have the worst day in the world, and there are things that I don't have control over. But I have to find gratitude, like you're talking about. And it is super simple things. And it is easy to find something in your day that you go, you know what? That was amazing. Right? Or maybe it sucked, but man, I learned something that I never have to do again. Yeah, you know, I'm not doing that again. No, I'm not doing that again. And one last thing is, is that I think about my dad and other people that I've lost in my life. I cannot imagine them looking down on me going, oh, you know what? She did another really not cool thing. She was not nice. She didn't do something good and she is not appreciative of what she has to be living. And I look at that and I go, I don't want them to look down on me and think that ever. It's a big deal to me. So I was not in Bob Hammer's situation when It's Not About the Bike came out, but I read the book as well when it came out. And the one takeaway that I had from that book was how Lance would talk about it's either a good day or a great day. And so uh, what I'm hearing is we, too, are the beneficiaries of a great day or a good day. Uh, and that's that's what it's all about. I mean, and uh, also, uh, you know, for those looking down on me that I, that I got to know throughout my life, if I, you know, on my watch, if I'm miserable over something that I don't need to be miserable about or if I'm, uh, you know, complaining or whining about stuff when I really have no reason to. It's making all of them look bad, you know, so uh, I feel obligated to them as well to, to kind of honor what I learned from them. Man, you know what's been tripping me out? I think about people from 100 years ago, like my ancestors from 100 years ago. I don't know if I've called my ancestors. <laughs> Who are all dead? Right. Who are all dead? <laughs> Who are all dead? Thank you, Tiffany. In 100 Thank years, you. we're all going to be gone. We're all going to be gone. Bob might still be hanging around but people with the cockroaches. Will have, but hey, people will have this episode, right? Forever. I hope so. Yes, forever. So, a hundred years ago, you think about it. They they didn't even all have cars. They didn't all have washing machines. They had those stupid roller things that you like push the clothes through to dry them off. Might have just you been know, rocks. It could have been rocks. They just beat the crap out of that. And you have these you have these states of existence, and you look at yourself right now. And you're like, God, what a pansy. Like Ralph Barcy a year ago, I'm sure he still would have been on top. But Ralph Barcy a hundred years ago was a hard man. He did not have <laughs> readily accessible antibiotics. He didn't have the telephone. Uh, he certainly didn't have the cell phone. No air travel. I mean, we're no like, mask. No mask. No, 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 no. They had a mask. They had masks. Anyway, my point is, dude, he you, was the dude where the women. We're naked with the feathers. That was a strip club. Do you need That's a no, different I thought that was no. Vegas. No, no, no. Vegas That's didn't exist Vegas. yet. <laughs> Cleopatra, you know. Oh No, no, no. He's white. He's not Egyptian. Oh, wow. Anyway, anyway my, my point is, you have 100 years ago, and you compare yourself. I've struggled with this. You compare yourself to 100 years ago. It's like, God, I would have gotten eaten alive. And I struggle with that. But the only thing, because these people from 1920, 1910, 1930, these were hard human beings. Okay, they, they knew how to make do with what they had. And if they had an iPhone and a laptop, they would have taken my lunch money in a second. They would have, they would have hammered me. But the only thing that got me out of that, I can't deny that. I can't deny it. Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't you think it's relative? Don't you think 100 years from now people will be saying the same about us? I'm so happy you said that because that's what I was about to say. Okay. 100 years from now, they'll say, look at dumb Ralph Barcy. He lost all his hair. He didn't have a cure. And they will have figured out the hair thing. 100 years from now, they will have figured out the Rona thing. 100 years from now, right? And they will have figured out this silly car thing 100 years from now. And We, we, they, have, we have cars. 
No, no, no. They right will now. have figured it out so we, we don't drive. No, just for we the people transport. who might be listening 100 years from now. Haven't oh, you seen okay. Star Trek? Come on. We're going to be transporting, and there will be no drunk transporting. You will at no point be at risk of transporting yourself uh, while under the influence. Did you just notice that my refrigerator matches the coaster? Let's get going. I wrap it all together. It, it's I wrap a, it all it together. It was a... Was this a Russian flag on the top? I'm so thing? grateful that goat. you noticed that. Thank I, you. That's a goat. That's what I do. I think he... I think oh, he, this is a goat on the top. Okay. I'm, my bad. You need some glasses, Bob. Listen to me. I've taken all of your time too much. Tiffany, God bless you. Ralph, you're the best. And Bob Hammer, I think I speak for every one of your golf participants, the 500 people you've spoken with your wife and your children when I say thank you for being here. You're the best, buddy. Absolutely agreed. God bless it. And you know what? Tomorrow, if you all don't have a ball, that's on you. Thanks, everybody. (laughs) 